presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Long Beach Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 44. Regarding a hit and run. A Ford sedan paid 146. Two Y Young 3146. Two Young 3146. Suspect driving this car struck an as a young boy at the corner of Pacific and 8th Street. Then drove on, failing to render aid. Bring him in. That's all. Tonight, I have an important word for boys and girls. Would you like to save a life? Listen to my announcement at the end of this program. I want you to join the Junior Police Department. I want to give you a real metal police badge and assign you to the work of saving lives. Be sure to listen. Every motorist has experienced narrow escapes. You've seen accidents happen to others where reserve power could have averted a crash and saved a life. That's why it's so important for you to have police car performance in your own car. With Rio Grande cracked gasoline in your tank, you can save seconds in emergency. You have power to spare. Acceleration that snaps you out of danger. Police cars use Rio Grande cracked gasoline to save precious seconds. You should use cracked because it costs you no more, yet gives you extra power and speed for emergency. Now our pleasure to introduce Captain C.B. Hall of the Traffic Patrol Division of the Los Angeles Police Department, who has a message for you. Good evening, Fran. The greatest traffic accident crusade in the history of the United States is now in progress. In 44 states of the Union and in the District of Columbia, Police officers are pledged to concentrate their efforts toward wiping out every possible carelessness and recklessness on the part of the driving public. Police chiefs of California and Arizona are pledged to make the Southwest the white spot of traffic accidents. This is by no means a simple or easy task. Every one of you within the sound of my voice must help. The statistics of traffic fatalities in the past year make dour and ghoulish reading. Consider just one of them. In 1933, the horribly bloody total of 17,200 men, women, and children met their death through the carelessness of drivers who failed to observe the elementary rules which every candidate for a driver's license is required to know. But statistics of thousands of deaths may still fail to impress. So tonight, we ask you to listen to the story of just one, the true tale of one member of that foolish company of innocent victims of the automobilist selfish carelessness. Thank you, Captain Hall. after Christmas last year. On a tree-lined street in Long Beach, shouting crowds of children drinking in the short days of their midwinter vacation are comparing their Christmas presents. New bicycles, new roller skates, footballs. In a vine-covered bungalow halfway down the block, Mrs. Green is distracted from her darning when the mid-afternoon quiet of the house is broken by the slam of the front door. Tommy? Is that you? Yes, Mom. Well, what are you doing coming home at this time of the afternoon? Aren't you going to the movies? Not this afternoon, Mom. I've got to deliver my Saturday's coat today. Oh, that's right, Tommy. I'd forgotten this is your busy day. Yeah, and boy, am I going to be busy. i got to get a lot more customers. But you've got too many now. Too many? Well, I haven't got new enough yet. All oh, those magazines are so heavy, Tommy. I hate to see you carry such a load. You're such a little boy. I am not, Ma. Gee, I'm 12, going on 13, and I'm as big as any kid my age on the block. Why, gosh, I'm nearly a man. Well, you'll always be a little boy to me. 
Oh, gee, Ma, don't talk that way. Yes, it's so, Tommy. You'll just have to get used to it. Hey, what you got that in there for, Mom? What? That teapot I got you for Christmas. Mm, because I like to look at it. Do you? Do you really like it, Mom? Oh, yes, son. But why, Mom? It's just a teapot. No, it's more than that, Tommy. You could have gotten lots of things for yourself with those brown vouchers that they give you as a bonus on your magazine. But instead of thinking of yourself, you thought of me first. And you saved up and got the teapot for me. Oh, that wasn't anything. Where do you see what I do when I get those new customers? What will you do then? Well, the first people are offering five brown vouchers for every new c- customer to get this month. Then if I can get enough, why, then I'll be able to get you a swell set of dishes for your birthday. Oh, Tommy, how sweet. Do you mind if I kiss you for that? Well, okay if you want to. Oh, gosh, Mom, it's nearly 3 o'clock. I've got to be getting downtown and picking up my magazine. All right, son. Be careful now. Sure. Look both ways when you cross the street. Don't worry, Mom. Just because school got so weak, I haven't forgotten what they teach us about safety first. It always pays, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, wish me luck, Mom. And maybe I'll get three new customers this afternoon. Oh, I'm sure you will. Now, don't be late for dinner. I won't. So long. So long, Tommy. delivers his magazines that sunny afternoon and is quite successful in getting new customers. His pockets jingling with coins and his thoughts on the brown vouchers he will get toward his mother's set of dishes, he starts for home. At the corner of 8th Street and Pacific Avenue, he carefully looks both ways and sure that the street is clear, he starts across. sedan suddenly weaves around the corner toward the lad. He looks up, horror wrenching his face. He attempts to spring from the automobile path. It swerves toward him. There is a sickening thud, and Tommy's inert form falls on the concrete as the careening Ford weaves on down Pacific Avenue. Stop wreck his damn car, the dirty... Hey, you, get over there! What's the matter? Get over there, run into you. Give it to him, Sam. Hey, what's the big idea? You know the wreck? Yeah, it would have been a good thing if we had. What's the big idea you hitting that kid back there? What's it? I don't know what you're talking about. That devil you don't. We saw you hit that kid on Pacific Avenue. Pacific Avenue? Yeah, what's he nuts? I ain't been on Pacific Avenue all day. Now, tell that to the cops. Hey, what is it, a flame-up? Listen, guy, it's no flame-up, and the least you say, the better. Well, you've got a can on you, you can smell a block. Drunk driving and hit and run. Now, you'll do a nice stretch for that. Now, look here. If you know what to do for you, you'll get the carriers out of my way and let me get going. Yeah? Well, you ain't going no place but the police station. Now, you have to show me your badge. Here's my badge, mister. This big fish in your face. Ah, uh, you can't arrest me. Listen, mister, hit and run is a felony, and a citizen can arrest any guy he sees committing a felony. Go on, Ben. Beat over to the police station and bring some cops over here. I'll watch you with our pal here, and if he tries to get away from me, I'll smear that big nose of his all over his ugly face. <laughs> are taking the hit-and-run driver into custody, a passing motorist has carried Tommy from the street to a nearby lawn and called the ambulance. Mrs. Green is notified, and a half hour later, stands red-eyed, him waiting, waiting outside a room in the seaside hospital. A detective attempts to quiet her. Oh, they're taking such a long time. Why can't I go in? Please let me go into my boy. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but the doctor oh, said... Oh, poor Tommy. Was he hurt badly, Lieutenant? Well, I, I couldn't tell, ma'am. He was unconscious. Was he 
pleading? Oh, no, ma'am. He was just scratched a bit from what I could oh, tell. Oh, why doesn't someone come out of that room? I can't oh, stand quiet, it. I can't. Quiet, ma'am. Quiet. Wait a minute. Here comes someone now. Oh. Oh, doctor. Is he... Is he all right? Doctor! I'm sorry, Mrs. B. Oh. Here, Lieutenant. Help me get into this chair. Nurse, bring me some spirits of ammonia. So now it's murder. Fact is skull. Poor kid. Here's the money, sir. Thank you. Well, I'll have to take his clothes into headquarters, Doctor. May prove valuable evidence. Sir. Close. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, she's coming around. Breathe deeply, Mrs. Green. Oh, uh, I must have fainted. It's silly. That's all right, Mrs. Green. Now, just sit here quietly. May I? May I see him, Doctor? Yes, in a few moments. Did he suffer it, Doctor? No. He never regained consciousness. Oh, that night. I'm glad he didn't suffer. Here are his things, Lieutenant. Thank you. Why, are those are Tommy's clothes. What are you going to do with them, Lieutenant? Well, I'm going to have to take them to headquarters, ma'am. No, no, no. That's his new sweater. I gave it to him for Christmas. You can't take it. Give it to me. Now, please, ma'am. You mustn't excite yourself. He loves it so, Doctor. And he looks so nice in it. Now, please, Mrs. Green. <laughs> There's a hole in the doctor. <laughs> Where he was stuck. That's why I must take it in. Why? Why? Well, that may give us a clue to the person who killed him. What good will that do? If you do find the driver of that car, if you find him and hang him from the highest tree, it will bring Tommy back. <laughs> to investigate the case, inspect the murder car at the garage where it has been impounded. There's no doubt about this being in the car. Look at the way that headlight's bent. Yep, bent up and to the left. And look at that dent on the radiator. That was made by that poor kid's head. He yeah, must have been doing 40. It hit him hard enough to make the radiator leak, too. You know, Lem, I'd like to see him swing for this. Yeah, so would I. But we're far from getting a case yet. You know that, don't you? Yeah, with no witness to the actual accident, it's going to be hard to convict him. As a matter of fact, we haven't been up so far to get the DA to issue a warrant. If we could only hey, find... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, hey, look here. What is it? See where these radiator pins are bent? Yeah. Well, look closely. Here, wait till I, wait till I throw my flashlight on it. There. See? Several green fibers from the kid's green sweater. Well, that would be my guess. Now we've got something to go on. Hey, where's that mechanic? Hey, you. Yes, sir. I'm sending a man over to photograph this car. Yes, sir. After he's through, I want you to take that radiator off and send it to me at headquarters. Okay. And don't wipe it off. Don't handle it any more than you have to. Understand? Yes, sir. All right, Lenz, let's go. Now we've got something to talk to this driver about. <laughs> ownership of the car that you were driving tonight, that Ford sedan you were in when you were arrested. I told you my wife and I owned it together. Well, this is the car you were driving when you hit that boy at Pacific and 8. I was on Pacific tonight. Well, what street did you drive on? I drove on Cedar Avenue. You deny driving on Pacific Avenue? Yes. Well, how fast were you driving on Cedar Avenue? About 15 or 20 miles, I guess. Uh, what were the condition of the lights? By lights, I mean the street lights. Dark. What do you know about this boy being hit at Pacific and 8? Nothing, only what those men told me. Yeah, those men you mean, the two who held you while you were arrested? Yes, I, I don't get what this is all about. Who's trying to frame you, Lieutenant? Hey, listen, we're doing the questioning. 
You confine yourself to answers. You deny hitting a pedestrian at Pacific and 8th? Yes, I, I don't know anything about it. Then how do you account for your right headlight being bent for the left as it is now on your car? Oh, that's new. That's easy. I, I bumped my car into a garage door when I was up to a cabin on the mountains two weeks ago. Just bent the head, bumping into a door, huh? Yeah, that's all. But your radiator is leaking, too, and the dust is rubbed off where you hit that kid tonight. His head dented that radiator shell. You can't accuse me like this. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know anything about it. You didn't know anything about the leaking radiator, eh? No. My, my wife had the car yesterday. Maybe it's trying to leak then. Radiators yeah. can bring leaks any time. Had uh, you been drinking this afternoon? No. Well, now, here's a report of the doctor who gave you the sobriety test when you were brought in. Huh? Well, he reports that you were intoxicated. Now stop beating around the bush, Mark. How much did you have to drink? Well, I did have an ounce glass of whiskey. An ounce glass of whiskey, eh? You don't handle your liquor very well, then, Mark. Why did you hit that boy and then drive on? I don't know anything about it. That boy wore a green sweater. There are green woolen fibers caught in your radiator. How do you account for that? Green woolen fibers in my radiator. That's strange. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but but uh, I can explain that. You can, huh? Yeah. Well, it might be interesting to hear your explanation. Suppose you tell us. Well, uh, a fellow who lives next door to me is a yarn salesman. He comes out a lot of wool in his backyard. I... I guess the wind blew some of it over and it caught in my radiator. Oh, come on. Yeah, that, that, that's the way it must have happened. Come on, Mark. Don't waste our time with a prairie story like that. That's the truth, and I can prove it. I'll have him come down here and tell you all about it. You can't send a drunk driving charge on me. Listen, this isn't a drunk driving case, Mark. This is murder. <sighs> that boy died an hour ago. He did. Yeah, it's too bad. I certainly hope you fellas got the guy that hit him. <laughs> The case of the police against Marks is far from complete. When the coroner's inquest is held two days later, Marks refuses to testify. The coroner's jury returns a verdict of accidental death as a result of being hit by a Ford sedan, but is unable to name Marks as the driver of the death car. Determined to bring Marks to face a crime of which they are convinced he is guilty, Dust Row and Lens call upon Ray Pinker, chemist of the Los Angeles Police Department, for assistance in identification of the woolen fibers found on the radiator. Burdened down with the radiator and Tommy's clothes, they interview Pinker in the Los Angeles Central Police Headquarters. Here's the radiator, Pinker. You can see the fibers and pins in those bent radiator fins. Oh, uh, yes. And here's the boy's sweater. This tear was made by impact with the car. Uh, there's no doubt about this bird being guilty, but he's trying to alibi those fibers by claiming that they blew over from a neighbor's yard and caught in the radiator. These fibers didn't catch in the radiator. They've been held there by these bent fins. Quite right. There's no question in our mind about the defendant's guilt. But we haven't got a case unless you can assure us that these fibers match the wool in the sweater. No one witnessed the actual accident, you see. Mm-hmm. Well, let me take one of those fibers out of the radiator with uh, these forceps. Now, I place it on this uh, glass slide. Uh, now, will you hand me the sweater, please? Yeah, here you are. Oh, you say this tear is where the boy was hit? Yes. All right. I'll take a fiber out of the yarn at the tear and put it to the right of the other one. Now we'll put a slide over that and see what the microscope has to say. Well, how about it? Mm, they're similar. Same color. Same yarn, I should say. Would you testify to that on the stand? Yes. Of course, there's no way of determining that the two fibers are identical. But the similarity added to the fact that the fibers are securely caught in the fins... They've been apparently flattened by some impact, should furnish a conclusive case for you, and I... Uh, wait a minute, uh, the horse. Uh, let me see that sweater. Oh. Hmm. Uh, notice that smudge near the tear? Yeah. Uh, just a minute. I, I want to try a reagent on that. I'll take a bit of that dark stuff and place it in the test tube here. Now, uh, we'll just pour this acid on it. Uh, there we are. Now, let me scrape some of that paint off the radiator fin. And we'll do the same thing with that. There. Now, notice. Why, why both the test tubes have turned cloudy. Mm, that's right. That smudge on the sweater is made from bituminous paint. That's what causes the cloudy appearance of the test tube. Bituminous paint is used for painting the radiators. Then the smudge on the sweater comes from the paint on that radiator. That's right. Then we've got this bird two way. Well, it isn't as positive as... Uh, as an identification of the fibers, 
The boy might have gotten his sweater smudged from the cumulus paint in any number of places. Ah, but there's no doubt it came from the radiator. He didn't have time to get the sweater dirty. It was a Christmas present. Mm, still, he might have. It'll be hard to convince a jury on the paint evidence. However, I'll be prepared to give it if the district attorney feels he needs it. That's fine, Picker. You've given us just what we need to send this guy out. Come on, Lynn. Let's go back to Long Beach and get the DA to swear out a complaint against Marks for murder. Presented with the evidence police science has provided, Deputy District Attorney William Brayton is quick to issue a complaint against Marks, charging him with murder, drunk driving, and hit and run. On January 4th, he is held to answer on all three charges, and his bail is set at $10,000. On February 26th, Marks goes on trial in Department A of the Superior Court. After several days of testimony, the defense introduces its star witness. You promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about your God. I do. What is your name? Robert Harper. Where do you live? At 827 La Jolla Avenue, Long Beach. Are you acquainted with the defendant? I am. Do you know where he lives? At 829 La Jolla, next door to me. What is your business, Mr. Harper? I'm a yarn salesman. How long have you been in this business? Fifteen years. You are familiar with the various colors used in dyeing yarns and the various texture of various kinds of yarns? Naturally. I'll ask you to come over to this table and investigate the wool fibers under these microscopes. The one on the right has been admitted as evidence from the radiator of the defendant's car. The one on the left is from the sweater of the deceased. Will you look at them, please? Good. <laughs> by a different dye. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Now, the court, please, I would like to introduce into evidence this chain of green yarn. Your Honor, I object. The counsel for the defense has not established any reason for this new evidence. Objection to stay. Mr. Harper, in your profession of yarn salesman, is it ever necessary for you to handle the yarn in any manner? Yes. Will you tell the jury how you handle it? Well, very often it's necessary for me to comb out the yarn and to rewind the skein. And uh, where do you do this? Well, my wife makes me do it out in the backyard because it gets the house all dirtied up with linen fibers. You know how women are. You can't do a thing with them. They... Order. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Harper. If the court please, I, I will seek to establish the identity of the yarn found on my client's radiator. For that purpose, I would like to enter this skein of green yarn into evidence. I hope I have established my reason sufficiently for the benefit of my worthy colleague of the prosecution. You may enter the evidence. I thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Harper, do you recognize this chain of yarn? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's one of my stock. Have you ever had occasion to comb this yarn? Yes. When? The 26th of December. Was that the day of the accident concerned in this case? No, it was the day before. Mm. And was there a wind blowing that day? Yes, I believe there was. Mr. Harper, I'm going to take a fiber of this yarn and place it under this microscope. That is, I will substitute it for the fiber taken from the sweater of young Thomas Green. Now, Mr. Harper, will you kindly step this way and inspect these two microscopes? In your opinion, Mr. Harper, is there any similarity between these two fibers? That is, the one found in the radiator of the defendant's car and the one from your yarn? Yes, they are identical. And how do you account for the fiber from your yarn being in the defendant's radiator? Well, while I was combing the yarn that day, Mark's car was parked in the driveway. I imagine the wind blew some of the lint over onto his place. Thank you, Mr. Harper. That is all. Do you wish to cross-examine, Mr. Prosecutor? You bet we do. Mr. Harper, have you examined Exhibit A, the radiator from the defendant's car? Yes. You've observed the manner in which the fibers are attached to the radiator? Yes. You have. How would you describe the manner in which they are attached? Mm, they're stuck there. Oh, stuck. Did you observe that they are stuck between several bent radiator fins? Yes. In your opinion, could the wind have 
the other day have blown the wool from your yard to the defendants and stuck the fibers in the radiator in the manner in which you've observed them? Well, I don't know. It was a pretty strong wind. It must have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Harper, here are the three exhibits. Fibers from the radiator, from the sweat of the deceased, and from the skein of your own yarn. Now, I'm going to place two of these exhibits under the microscope. There. Will you please inspect these two exhibits? Your Honor, I object. The prosecuting attorney is tricking the witness. Your Honor, my learned colleague of the defense has himself established the witness as an expert on yarns. I am merely asking for an expert opinion on the exhibit, in the same manner as defense counsel has done, excepting that I am not leading the witness. Objection, Alvaro. Proceed. Now, Mr. Harper, will you step down here, please, and examine these exhibits? Mm. Now, Mr. Harper, in your opinion, are the fibers you've just examined under the microscope similar or not? They are identical. Thank you, Mr. Harper. That is all. I will now pass around the exhibit. You will observe, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that they are exhibits C and D. The fibers from the radiator and from the sweater of the deceased. And when permitted to inspect them without being coached, Mr. Harper has found them to be identical. On March 5th, the case of the state versus Thomas Mark is given to the jury, and two hours later, they return a verdict of guilty on all three counts. On March 7th, Mark faces the judge to hear a sentence passed on him. Thomas Mark, stand and face the court. Before I pass judgment on you, have you anything to say? Nothing to say. Thomas Wark, the jury has found you guilty of sections 112 and 141 of the California Vehicle Act. While in the act of committing one felony, that of drunk driving, you committed another, hit and run. As a result, the jury has also found you guilty of second-degree murder. I am disappointed with this verdict. I only wish that they had returned a verdict of first-degree murder with no recommendation. It would give me great pleasure to sentence you to hang, for you are no less a murderer than the man who runs amok with a revolver. An automobile in the hands of a man under the influence of alcohol is an instrument of death. The streets and highways of California our lethal paths for our children as well as for us until your type of criminal has been done away with. The verdict of the jury constrains me from giving the sentence I feel you deserve and compels me to pass a much too light judgment on you. That cannot be helped now. Therefore, Thomas Marks, I hereby sentence you to serve from five years to life in San Quentin Penitentiary. Now, boys and girls, here's the announcement I promised you. How would you like to be junior police officers? Your police department needs you to save lives. If you wear the official police badge of the junior police department, you can prevent traffic accidents. You can protect your schoolmates, even save a life. It costs you nothing to join the Junior Police Department. You can get a genuine metal police badge free. Just go to the nearest independent service station selling Rio Grande cracked gasoline, ask for a Junior Police Department enrollment card, sign and mail it, and you will get your free police badge and official orders by mail. Parents. Urge your boys and girls to get a junior police department enrollment card from your Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealer. There is no charge. The police badge is free. And it makes your youngsters think safety first. Police calling all 
cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 44, regarding a hit and run. Suspect in this case now in custody. That's all. Hauling all cars is based on confidential police files and is written and produced by William M. Robeson. Frederick Stark directs the orchestra. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs> <laughs>